antidepressant drugs, but there is a propensity at the medical clinic level in your neighborhood to just hand out drugs without, uh, without uh, talk therapy, or in some situations where they can do talk therapy, they, they actually engage in groups um, and gender, gender uh, exclusivity in, in, in the villages and places like that. But I will say this, is that in my research, uh, and one of the challenges that I feel faces the country, and this is never discussed at the policy tables, never, ever discussed at the policy level of the international community or whatever, is that um, if you have a population so traumatized and you have elevated numbers that are suspect as well, unfortunately, quantitatively, where you have high levels of suicide of men, lots of um, depression among the population, gender, uh, women react differently, and what you have is a high level of dysfunctioning people where they talk about, um, I'm sick or I don't feel well today. This affects everybody. And the level of it is, um, is, is probably exceeds what in most societies is average. There's probably about five to eight percent, maybe, of depression and levels, different, different manifestations of mental illness throughout the population. You have low numbers of psychiatric beds. You have a stigma attached to psychiatric treatment. Um, and it's, it's very, very unfortunate. I actually agree that some of the things that you're talking about and what the panel's already addressed is that um, it's so pervasive and the population has been so traumatized that one of my questions raised is how can people that have borne this trauma, experienced this trauma, actually participate in creating a vibrant democracy and notwithstanding all the limitations of Dayton, and there are many. So, and then you have the whole factor of immense poverty. Refik um, brought up the whole issue of the World Bank report. There also, there's been a poverty reduction strategy put out there. One of the consequences of genocide is that you have many more women heads of households that have never worked before. Um, you have a brain drain out of the country and people continuing to seek it. People are also persecuted for other reasons. I have done sworn affidavits for people who are gay, leaving both the Federation and Republika Srpska because of persecution and isolation from their family and fear for their lives. So there's a lot of issues here that are ongoing that no one at the international level of the, of the Peace Implementation Council or the Office of the IRF is even beginning to address. And it's a public health issue. Well, and that is, yes. I was just going to say, what's uh, surprising is that you'll see that I'm not a very young person, that this study was done on people. What's concerning is that they believe that there's actually a biological change that they're studying to see whether this isn't even passed on one generation down. Mm -hmm. Into a generation. Trauma is actually a, um, a something that can be passed on. And um, so it'll be interesting. Well, there, there are high that. levels of breast cancer uh, in Bosnia. There are other illnesses too. Many people and many Bosnians here, I'm sure, know this that they seek health care outside of the country because the health care system is also suspect in terms of payoffs, under, under the table payoffs to doctors. So people actually seek health care elsewhere in the region and beyond. So I think that, you know, I think what you're saying is, is you know, probably very true. And uh, there needs to be more done in the public health arena wholesale just just a quick good point. The difference in Bosnia is, of course, that you're living many times next to the person who persecuted you, unlike most of the victims of the Holocaust, 
who either were murdered or, of course, uh, emigrated. The other point of the Holocaust that I think is very relevant here is that uh, really there were other pogroms and there were other genocides before uh, in history. The Holocaust was rather unique because probably people like General Eisenhower and others made sure it could not be forgotten. And I think there, and I as a young boy growing up in this country, remember that very much wasn't discussed about the Holocaust really until about 30 years after the Holocaust. Um, which, which brings me to the point, um, why is Europe and even the United States so ready to accept a Serbia and of course a part of Bosnia that is so flawed that has perpetuated these murders, these vast abuses? If uh, in somewhere in the historical context there's this idea that, well, you know, the, the strong survive. And basically, it's the weak who get killed out. And in, and in this context, I think there are many who who see the Bosnians as uh, fit fit victims because, of course, they are quote unquote Muslims, uh, as of course Holocaust victims were Jews, and in part because they really don't belong in Europe. I really like Jews don't belong in Europe. The same kind of theory, and therefore, uh, there's this tendency to overlook what's happened in Srebrenica in a way that I, as an American, would never allow 9-11 to be overlooked. Um, so when someone asks me, why the heck am I so focused on Srebrenica? Because as an American, I'm also focused on 9-11. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of more questions. I will start here. Please introduce yourself. Well, why don't you take all the questions again? Uh, why not? Yes, yes. <laughs> Please. Here I'm and then, then there's Zani, I'm two questions there. Uh, in New York. Um, Something which really gave me a little hope yesterday on the news, I saw um, a son of the Nazi uh, uh, criminal who committed atrocities in Albania. He killed uh, dozens of innocent people, and the son came to the village apologizing to all the people in the village, which was nice to see. And um, even right now, I'm a little skeptical, but it's a hope that uh, also the Serbs and whoever committed atrocities in the Balkan will come to uh, I'm from Yugoslavia. I, I immigrated in 1990. Uh, it breaks my heart to see Bosnia, uh, a nation with three religions now split apart because of the extreme nationalism from the left and right. Uh, it's, it's really bad. Since I'm a physician, I would uh, go with the sociopathological issues and sociopsychological issues uh, haunting the whole nation now, and you see a collective depression. I don't know if any, we all talk about it, we can maybe observe it, but if anybody had done any survey to see what's the underlying issue, what's the fundamental part of the collective depression and people don't want to move away from the day that happened. I fear that uh, that might be that uh, justin, justice has not prevailed. Mm -hmm. I, I really fear that that's the reason. And in, the, in this type of soil, I don't think uh, a peace is sustainable. Um, uh, also, the town when 8,000 people were killed was rewarded to Serbia and in the face of the United Nations and international community. Um, I, I don't think that those are very, very unacceptable moments uh, which are really uh, holding us back from developing sustainable peace in this part of the world. Um, some things are overlooked and some things are not well done. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, will be the research will be a little bit more thorough, and we can make some conclusion. In in an unhealthy environment, politics and policies won't win. Uh, I think we have to work with the people and, and raise their hope up. Okay, open the door to to some more quality work when people will open their eyes or raise the hope. I fear that they don't see the hope right now. Right. I mean, so uh, probably uh, you should criminals address have also. I have a question for the Bosnian yes, government. Is there any anybody in the country who will hunt the criminals like uh, a wonderful job did the Jewish community of hunting Nazis, even maybe we remember two, three years ago, catching one of the like bad guys? Uh, are, we yes, gonna, yeah. are we gonna have something like that? Because at this point, I don't see many criminals showing up. I think they're hiding. Maybe because the Serbian government is run by the people who were closest to Milosevic at that time. Now they're head of the country. Yes, president, ministers, prime ministers. Uh, something is really so rotten and nobody is doing anything. And, and I feel so bad for that. 
and, and it's so easy, it's so simple, and it's not moving. I, I don't know where is the problem. Please. Well, you can skip me in the interest of time, but if I have a moment now. All right, so please, then, and then we will go back. Yeah. Um, uh, my name is uh, okay. I'm working in Luka, and I was forced to leave my uh, old time. please go to the questions, rather? Sure, sure. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, quick question to Mr. Shashube, and please. just a, I'll give you a little short story, just sure. that the two of you gentlemen, Mr. Aldovich and Shashube, you are heroes. We were growing up looking at, watching TV and looking at you as heroes, somebody who's going to change our destiny, who's going to change our lives in Bosnia. And you were great fighters. Now I'm, I don't want to be emotional, but I'm being bothered by your uh, forgiveness for it. Last year you started out in uh, Turkish Cultural Center. You emphasize that, that we need to forgive. And then you go to all these great problems that are coming, you know, from big uh, superpowers. Who do we forgive? The big superpowers that left us uh, to be slaughtered? We forgive Serbians who killed us. Uh, do I forgive a Miller Adotic who doesn't even want to recognize that there was a genocide there? Or do I forgive a Serbian current president, Nicholas, who wasn't really participating in the war, but is supporting uh, all the criminals, war criminals, and all the people who uh, had their part in genocide, and he came up with an apology, and he's the only one. So who do I forgive today? It is, it is something that, you know, I, you're an American more than a Bosnian. And I wouldn't have it in my heart to ask you to forgive uh, uh, for 9-11 and all those uh, uh, victims and families of those victims. I wouldn't find it in my heart you know, to ask that lady to forgive uh, Nazis for Holocaust. So I, I don't understand who are we supposed to forgive and I, what is that going to change if we forgive? Yeah. Is it, no, is I, it, I, I think I, I, can, I, can, I can answer your question very simply. I'm not forgiving anyone. It's not up for me to forgive. It's up to people like you who lost your home maybe lost family members, and it's people like the mother of Srebrenica to forgive. Actually, I think it's a great show of courage and a great show of um, um, moral strength that they have already undertaken those steps with those who are asked to forgive. <coughs> Milorad Dodik, Radko Mladic, Karadzic, Nikolic, they never asked for forgiveness. So I can only outline them as being more culpable than ever. Uh, but in the end, like you, like you also pointed out, no one from Washington has asked forgiveness for what happened. No one from London. No one from, um, uh, from Brussels or Paris or Moscow. So I agree with you. I think you misunderstand my message. It is, I think it is a very healthy sign for society to forgive, but someone has to first ask you to forgive. All the people exactly. you mentioned have not. Exactly. And, and, and I'm emphasizing that it is my role who has, who has um, uh, not suffered the same fate as you, or particularly Mother Sepernica, to remember and remind. And remember what happened, and then remind that in fact these people have not asked for forgiveness, and that the injustice persists. My guess is if you go back to Banja Luka today, you're not so comfortable there as you might have been in, as a child. So there's something wrong with that. All right, so just a question you, you had before. I, I apologize. I have to ask a question, and perhaps uh, Ambassador Van Vessel, this is directed to you as someone removed from the context. Uh, my name is Harris Mohamed. I'm the uh, member of the uh, Board of Trustees of the Carnegie Council for Ethical International Affairs, one other thing. But the question is very simple. The argument has been made that the international community is com uh, complacent or at least uh, indifferent about the condition that Bosnia is currently at. The legal framework, the peace framework, all the inconsistencies with the European values. Is the, is the case, really, that they have nobody to, to have this dialogue with? Is it the case that the, the weakness of, and the ownership of the opposing message on the side of the victims, uh, the message with strength, conviction, uh, intensity, <coughs> Is it the fact that because there's no such deliberate courage to oppose what is imposed, that is not allowing <coughs> us to have this dialogue with the United Nations, with Brussels, with Washington, or it's simply that there's no goodwill left in the system? Um, <coughs> well, uh, it's, not, it's not an easy question. I think the, you know, Mo, Mo has has talked about this a bit. I think there is just something in the 
way that this war was ended, that has not allowed the, move, the country to move forward. Um, so you don't have, I think you don't have a society that is able to come together in a way that allows it to move forward in a, in a unified way. But what is certainly true is if you, you know, if you go to the UN today, you will not find anyone who talks about Bosnia. People do not talk about Bosnia. People talk about Kosovo, and they talk you know, a bit about Serbia, and they talk about all kinds of things, but Bosnia is, in a way, a bit of a forgotten place. And honestly, I think very, most people don't know much about what is going on. UN is a place that deals with crises, and Bosnia is not considered a crisis today. And that, uh, you know, that also, we have six months reports of the high representative in security. We do. So, it's so, on, so would, you, would you agree that the message of the victim, or of the victimized society that has been put in this condition, is completely absent and broken? And there's no virtual dialogue happening to change the status quo. It takes two for dialogue. I think that, that the other side is absent, absent in, in this. Well, it's supposed to be a conversation with conviction. I think there is, as far as I can, I can see, there is no genuine dialogue going on to change the status quo. Yes, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that the, the voice of the of, of the victims is is uh, is completely uh, forgotten, but it's certainly you know, it's certainly not something that comes up regularly. It comes up. Yes, before we go to two more and actually three questions, uh, will you, Refi, please address this issue of the gentleman, Dr. Mortazani, on the, who is going to hunt the, uh, those who crimes, the criminals? Um, I, I, I cannot not tie that in with the question of my friend who is about to leave, so I would ask him to stay. Because I want to, I'm sorry to, to uh, jump to you like this, but I think you asked the crucial question it is at the heart of what we are talking about. Um, and it actually ties in with, with the question. Do we need to forgive? Do we need to reconcile? What does that actually mean? What does it mean concretely? Do we, uh, like, like, uh, the goal and Adenauer have two people that represent us and sort of do it for us, like Nikolic and I don't know, is it Vegovic? I don't know. I, I don't think I would subscribe to that reconciliation. Like mothers from Severinsa, they usually say, look, who am I to reconcile with? I never quarreled with anyone. Those who, who killed my child, I will never forgive. And having children, I understand perfectly. And other Serbs, I have no problem with. We know. I have a bad word exchanged between us. So, what is it when we are talking about here? Forgiveness and reconciliation. Like, like Ambassador Sarchipe said, you cannot do it for someone else. And do we need to do that to have a healthy society, really? To, to, to actually you know, shake hands and say, okay, let's move on. I have to say that the more I think about it, and I work for an organization which is trying to figure out what is this actually about, what is important in aftermath of such mass atrocities to actually get societies to the position where they are able to sustainably develop. It's institutions. That is the key. It is the institutions who will hunt down war criminals in 10 years, in 20 years, in 50 years. Institutions, not NGOs. I mean, it's great to, to have NGOs like Simon Wiesenthal Center, but they work with Mossad. So it is institutions like the court of B&H, like SIPA, that we need to boost, we need make sure that they get plenty of resources, that they have people who are not corrupted, that 
we put pressure on them to do their job. We need institutions to deal with, with uh, the, the, the problem that the lady was talking about that uh, before she left, transgenerational transfer of trauma, collective depression, the, the, the impact that this had on all of us. Just, you are here. You, you, you will forgive me, Bosnian diaspora, but you know that 90% of people from Bosnia are stuck still in 1992. Still, to this day. And, and without adequate help. And that cannot happen without strong institutions. And I know that there is a lot to be asked of the international community. I, I, I fully support that. But it is about us. Like, like Ambassador Benavides said, nobody cares anymore. Nobody cares. I mean, there, there are so many more difficult issues. At the, look at Syria. I mean, people are dying there by the hundreds every day. Look at Burma. Look at all these places where we, we see wholesale killing going on as we speak. I mean, Bosnia, come on, our problems are whether Jacob will score goals and whether our team will make it to Brazil. And, and this is not even talked about in Bosnia. So it is up to us, and, and I, I have to say, I'm very hopeful we have such great potential, we have such great people, but we have to actually do something for ourselves. Because it's been 18 years of us looking for, for someone else to do it for us, while at the same time, Serbian politics were very different. They never relied on international community, they were always in conflict with international community, and I have to say, Ambassador Shachibay will speak to this with most authority, but there is that charm that international interlocutors have seen in Serbians for this, in Milosevic, even in Mladic and Karadzic and others. Nobody, nobody likes to listen to a victim all the time. Yes, there is compassion, but we have to stop being victims. We have to get rid of that mentality that somebody owes us something and take ownership of, of, of our country, of our lives, of our society, and build these institutions. Then I, I have to say, I, I, my mother lives in Prijedor, I go there all the time. She has problems with all her neighbors. So you don't have institutions? Only few are on the basis of, of, of what happened before mostly because they hate her for the two dogs that they, she has and they bark all the time. And this issue of, does she reconcile with people who are attacking her, does she not, is her own. Nobody will do that for her. So I think that, that we need to focus on what is important. Let's build institutions that, that can help us deal with the aftermath of what happened to us. and understand what happened to us, and then leave to everyone to deal with reconciliation and, and forgiveness or on, on the level of, or, I don't know, personal, cultural, religious, whatever context that they feel comfortable with. My question was, uh, do you have the institution right now? Do you have a yes, yes, there is a court to be. And you have international police. You can just no, we have our own police. Yeah. There are war crimes trials all the time. Today, five people were arrested for war crimes. It's not like that's not yeah. happening. But it's not happening at the, at the sp uh, speed. And the, the, the most important thing is lacking. And that is public debate about the context, why this is happening. Because it doesn't really matter that you will arrest someone if the society does not know why is it important that this person was arrested. I mean, it ends up being important only to them and to the prosecutors and judges, no one else. And before I give the floor to these two ladies who are waiting, just for the record, let me and I would add that actually not all international interlocutors, especially among the American administration, Look, Joe Biden, he went to Belgrade 1993 and he said in the eyes to Milosevic, you are more criminal and you are whatever, I don't like to use any French words. I would beg to say that he is an exception of the rule. Uh, okay. I, I, sure. Can I make a comment? Please, please. I just want to, I want to actually push back on Mo a little bit about the United States. 
I don't think the United States has cared about Bosnia and has not been invested in the ongoing, whatever you want to call it, a peace process, reconciliation, whatever, and fix what they messed up. When George Bush was elected president, selected, rather, let me just say that. <laughs> But, yeah, yeah, and he was selected. <coughs> the first month he took office, they shut down the Dayton office. Then 9-11 happened. I told my friends in Bosnia and throughout the region, it will not be the same. The United States is going to disengage. They're going to do it now. And they have, in fact, disengaged dramatically, for better or for worse. You can talk about what whatever how you might feel about it. Now the Europeans are more directly involved, and I have my personal opinions about that. So I would just say that, that we have not been engaged, and we are overextended. You know, we are definitely overextended, and we're not going to come back into it. Interestingly enough, you did make a point that historically, it's always been big power that come into the Balkans and get involved in trying to resolve disputes. I mean, history is replete with examples. So I just want to say that. I also agree with Refik. It's time that people in Bosnia take ownership and develop their institutions. But I would also add there's a number of factors compounding that ability to move forward, and it has to do with poverty, it has to do with public health issues, and I think it has to do with the fact that a lot of young people have left or want to leave, you know, and I, I can't blame them. There, uh, the United States admitted 90,000 people from Bosnia into this country, and I'm glad we did that. I'm glad that we created a home for people here. Well, uh, 300,000, right, yeah, and 90,000 Families. 90,000 families. But what I want to say about that is that there's 80 countries where Bosnians went all over the world. All that talent, all that ability, all that, that capacity has left it, and that's a compounding factor in Bosnia today. But, uh, let, me, let me just uh, come back to the 